So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Watson. I'm delighted to be your new host today on what is now episode two of the third season of the show. Uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you for Tom, uh, Tom Hall, who uh, was our, my predecessor and did a, such a great job. Uh, I'm sure he's watching this. And of course, a massive thank you to you, the audience, for allowing us to give giving you an, an excuse to keep doing these shows. Yay, great. Uh, look, we love spending this time with you, geeking out on all topics around Windows Server 2022. And uh, it's coming up to the end of month four now at Microsoft for me. And a huge part of our culture is all about learning, um, which I'm loving, quite frankly. And uh, But look, the idea of this show is to share that wealth and you know expand on that learning culture. And so each episode of From Rock to the Cloud, we will have some of the world's most foremost figures in Windows Server to help you get whatever you need um, to know, or, or just what you want to know about Windows Server. Um, and as always, if you have any questions about the episode, please make sure you pop them in, into the, uh, the comments section below. So let's look at today's agenda. Yes, below. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, today's agenda uh, and today's episode is all about managing your Windows Server with Azure. Um, for the next 30 minutes, I'll be catching up with yours truly here, Mr. Pierre Roman. I'll let him introduce himself in a second. And we also have some elements, as always, a little bit of fun uh, that, that you guys can get involved with. So please do stick around. Um, so uh, from here on in, uh, we would like to introduce you to uh, Pierre Roman, who today is joining me. Pierre, can you please introduce yourself to the audience who's watching? Yes. Uh my name is Pierre Roman. I'm a senior cloud advocate with Microsoft. And uh, you mentioned that the foremost experts, uh, the, the worldwide foremost experts were on this show. They couldn't be here today, so you get me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been I've been in uh, in IT for, and I'm going to age myself here uh, for over thirty years. Um, how, many managing, more uh, over 30 years? how many more? How many more over? How many more over thirty? Uh, uh, four more over thirty. Yeah, well, you've beaten me by two, actually, Pierre. So uh, also showing my, I think it must be the grey, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can tell by that's why I shaved the head that way. That my my head, my whole head is not silver. Uh, but <laughs> in that time, we've managed everything from Vax and and mainframes to uh, servers to and now cloud. So we've been go we've gone through multiple transition periods in the world where, like technology drastically changed the way we do things, and cloud is here now, and we're in the middle of this shift uh, to the cloud. And don't get me wrong, uh, we are at some point gonna be mostly cloud-based, but I think that, uh, and uh, Jason Zander, our uh, corporate vice president for uh, Azure, uh, the last on uh, the last in-person event that he spoke at, uh, said that hybrid is now, we realize that hybrid is our customer's end state. So when you're talking to uh, marketing people and you're talking to salespeople or you're talking to a technologist of any kind and they're telling you that you have to migrate everything to the cloud, that's not true. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hybrid is our end state. Mm -hmm. But because of that, we had to come up with multiple ways and easier ways to manage all of your machines, regardless where they may be, in the same way. Because nobody wants to have to learn three different sets of tools to manage three different sets of yeah. machines indeed Just not Lots efficient different silos absolutely and cost not cost efficient either right never mind operational simplicity um if you so, have too many balls in the air you're going to drop one indeed absolutely and i'm no juggler i don't know about you no not, never, not very well <laughs> so shall we jump into today's topic absolutely are you ready yeah i am so um as I say, the topic title is Managing Your Windows Server with Azure. So I've got some questions, Pierre, that I've, I've kind of prepared. Uh, I hope you're going to be in a good position to answer them. I don't want to catch you out by any surprise or anything. I'm sure that's not going to be the case. So let's look at question number one, shall we? How does cloud services improve your on-prem environment? How does cloud services improve your environment? Well, first thing is that cloud services are always evolving. So as new threats are coming in, new management um, paradigms are being uh, brought uh, forward, 
those tools will be evolving. And if you take advantage of them, you don't have to deploy everything again on prem. Like I, I love a, a system center uh, configuration management and all of that system center uh, type of management tools that uh, that are still available today and are, are great, great um, management tools. But anybody who deals with them knows that whenever there's an update, it's it's a project in itself just to roll out the updates and you need an infrastructure yeah. to manage the infrastructure. So you end yeah. up like a chicken and the egg where how do you manage the infrastructure that's managing the infrastructure? Yeah. By using cloud services, you kind of uh, uh, eliminate a whole kind of layer of complexity over your on-prem environment but we're not just talking about on-prem environment. You may have servers on-prem. You may have servers in AWS. You may have servers at a hoster uh, somewhere else down the road uh, and some in Azure. Who knows? Maybe all of them, uh, all of the above, maybe GP, GCP as well. You don't want to have to have different sets of tools for managing all of these or having four times the same set of tools in four different locations. So you don't yeah. have a, 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 a top-down view of all of the responsibility areas that you have. You don't have a top-down view of the health of your environment. You don't have a top-down view of whether or not uh, attacks are occurring and where they're coming from and where are they going. So when we're looking at cloud, what cloud services can do to help you manage your Windows Server environment, that's what it does is it simplifies that it allows you to take advantage of best of breed and all of the innovation that's being put into it all of the ai that's being put in the back of them because you can mm -hmm. collect as many logs as you want like i mentioned i've been in the business for a long time like one of my first job my 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 role on monday morning was to go to the server room and log into every server and go to this windows server uh, and basically go to uh, events viewer and look for any red uh, stop signs on the event viewer and then investigate whether or not this was an actual critical that we needed to deal with or was that just informational and so on. Brain, human brain's not meant to be going through hundreds and hundreds of lines of, of logs. By, by line 200, your brain's not even registering trends. You're seeing yellows and greens and reds, but you're not registering any trends. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this I'm assuming these are the days before you were utilizing more of a manager of manager type tool, right? And in the very early days of Windows Server. Yeah, yes, yes. Very, very early days before the tools like SCCM uh, and Config yeah. Manager became Indeed. available. But that's, that kind of tells you what the involvement, uh, how evolved it's become. But now the, those that AI model that's sitting behind, for example, Azure Monitor or or uh, um, Insight uh, in Azure, it already knows and it's constantly learning. It's taking uh, telemetry from from Microsoft, from our own, for example, security groups, and for our management groups and our network <coughs> groups, and it and it's uh, putting models together and it's applying those models to your data to surface up potentially like threats, potentially uh, issues that are gonna come up, um, trends in terms of, okay, your CPU has been going slightly on the upward trends for the last six months. And at that rate, we, expense, we expect that your, your workload is going to run out of resources on that server in six months. So it does give you the opportunity to say, okay, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to move it? Am I going to uh, add more resources to it? Um, am I going to split the load across multiple machines? Like it, it gives you time as opposed to getting the alert that, oh, that machine is out of resources and they're like, okay, now you are scrambling. Yeah, Time is, is a resource. I was going to say, and the risk of also taking something down, right? In the old days, it'd be a reactive kind of situation. Everybody's running around frantically trying to go and fix things, right? So to be predictive is obviously a good thing. Which kind of yes. brings me on to the next question then, Pierre. So you kind of alluded to it to an extent. Now, what tools do you need to achieve this, really? For Windows Server, uh, there's there's a little linchpin here, and I, and I, I talked about it this week on another show. Uh, 
I, I it's it's almost like the Lord of the Rings. It's like it's the it's the precious. It's the one the one rule the one <laughs> ring to rule them all. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, Azure Arc. So our okay. Arc enabled server, which by the way is free. So you deploy that to any server. And what it does is it identifies. So if you got servers, Windows servers in Azure, uh, the tools are available to you, no problem. But if you got on-prem uh, servers and if you got uh, servers on uh, other platforms or at hosters, you can deploy those agents to that server. And what that does is it creates an identity from that server into the cloud. Once you've got that identity, that relationship between that on-prem server and the cloud services, now it's really easy for you to say, okay, on these servers that are on-prem in AWS, wherever they may be, and say, I want to deploy patch management to those or update management as it's officially called. I want to deploy um, desired configuration state, uh, their desired state configuration to them. I want to deploy uh, auto manage to so make sure that they're backed up, that they're protected. Uh, I want to make sure that Sentinel is using the logs of that machine so that we can, if there is a break in, if anybody gets compromised, that we can actually trace and investigate uh, where where it came in and and how and what's been compromised. So all of these require logs, require metrics, require data. And that is provided by that link that Azure Arc provides. So can I just be clear then, all those logs and data all still sit within the server. Arc is just extracting what it needs to understand or is everything ported back up into Arc as a central console back into the Azure Cloud? How, how does that work exactly? No, Arc, Arc, uh, which is also uh, in some cases misunderstood, Arc is basically the facilitator. Arc okay. creates the relationship and the and maintains the identity of those servers in Azure. Okay. Arc doesn't send any data over and only sends metadata about that server in terms of maintaining the relationship. So in terms of compliance and stuff like that, no no issues there. Now, if you decide to start monitoring that server using other tools like uh, Azure Monitor or Microsoft Defender or Microsoft Sentinel or update management, in that case, you need to start ingesting some uh, of the data in, in, in terms of what all the patches are installed on each server. And that gets pro brought in uh, by Azure Monitor. So you roll out Azure Monitor agent. So you tell basically Arc, take the Azure Monitor agent and deploy it on my servers. So it deploys the agent and then Azure Monitor starts collecting that data. It only collects what you tell it to collect, to collect. and it is uh, you manage where it's sent. So you basically create your log analytics workspace. So if you're in uh, in England and Great Britain and you have a, a requirement to stay within the confines of the country, you can define, I want my log analytics workspace to be in in uh, in England, or for me in Canada. And then once your machines are connected to it, they only send their data to that location. So you control where and how much data is being sent. But once that data is the, in, in the Azure Monitor or in the Log Analytics workspace, then other services like Update Management, like Sentinel, start using that data in order to surface up. This server is missing a critical update or that server has been compromised or there's been 20 uh, uh, admin logon um, attempts on this particular uh, workstation or server. And then you can start mm -hmm. acting uh, or reacting to that or planning based on the metrics that are being uploaded. Yeah, got it. So I think this is kind of rhetorical and you alluded to it earlier or alluded, alluded to it earlier in terms of cost. Where does the cost aside? Is there a cost? I think you mentioned as your arc is, is free of charge, but I'm assuming yeah. once the other tools start to then take effect, then there's probably going to be some kind of cost to that. Would that be a first so, thing? Yes. So arc is to establish that relationship and exchange that metadata. That's free. That's mm -hmm. included in your subscription. No extra cost. When you start collecting logs and metrics from all of those machines, 
because you control how much of it you're ingest and what you're ingesting, there is a cost for that log ingestion on log mm-hmm. analytics. It's not a huge cost. It's still significantly lower than if you would have to deploy your own system center configuration management infrastructure because you don't have to pay for servers. You don't have to pay for licensing. You don't have to pay for anything else. You pay for the ingestion of the data into log analytics. Then if you deploy Sentinel or or uh, uh, um, update management, then you're charged the same as you would be for an Azure machine. And I don't have the the, the, the cost uh, associated with me. I, I try as much as possible to stay away from uh, cost and licensing. Uh, I, I'm more of the tech guy and I, I leave the licensing and cost to the salespeople. And but all the people like on the, who want to me? make some money. And all the people out there who are clearly looking to sell these things and, and you know, kind of make some money at the same time, right? Yeah, I, I'm just looking at how we can use the technology in order to bring value to the uh, enterprise. I know there's a cost associated with it, uh, but the cost is you you have some control over how much it costs because you have a control over how much data you're ingesting. And then for like Azure Sentinel, there's a cost per machine to be protected. And I think as and you mentioned you can find as well, yeah. Sorry, I think as you mentioned as well, and, and, and one of my former roles is infrastructure management and tools and so on and so forth. And, you know, they sometimes take a lot of effort to maintain. If there's, you know, to the point that cost comparison with something like Azure doing some of this work or all of this work in comparison to the build your own type scenario is going to be pretty significant regardless, right? It's absolutely going to be a significant considering too that we're now looking at hybrid. So it's not just the on-prem machines, but it may be yes. your hosters machine. It may be your AWS machines. So imagine if you had to set up this environment, but set it up four times and then set up some kind of, of link so that they could exchange that data so that you could have a top-down view of your entire environment. Yeah. Are you going to say single pane of glass? I was going to, but I'm trying not to as much anymore because it's it's a term that's been overused. I think. Um, yeah, I, was just I, I have a thing. I have a thing for for uh, for marketing terms like everybody that keeps talking about uh, skilling. When yeah. I'm just okay, we've been calling it training for like ever. Why are we suddenly have to change the term? Indeed, yes, or, or empowerment, perhaps. So in terms of all that, where do you think, you know, the benefits would be? Who would, you know, would it help security companies or government departments, for example? Where do you think the best area of, of, of where this fits? I'm going to give you the consulting answer and say it depends, but um, I'm sharing a, a slide here that's kind of like a top-down view of everything that we have. And if you're looking at that one where you have your your services across your infrastructure and your infrastructure can be uh, on-prem in Azure, somewhere else, anywhere, and then through Azure Arc and that metadata and that identity that's created, you can have like Defender and Sentinel monitor Azure policies, which management loves, especially when you have uh, compliance and regulations that you have to apply to because you set up a policy and you can apply it to all your machines regardless where it is. So in terms of password management, in terms of auditing, in terms of guest configuration management, you can set policies uh, and even have remediation tied to those policies. So if a machine drifts out of policy, it can be brought back into policy. Update management, inventory management, uh, Azure Auto Manage, which is uh, newly uh, added to that list, where uh, the backup of that machine, the uh, uh, odd auto um, updates, uh, all of the normal stuff that you would normally set up on a machine just gets turned on by default, yep. like automatic. Yep. You just say auto manage this machine and it takes care of the rest in the background. Of course, there's always a cost associated with some of those services, but there's something in there for, there's something in there for the IT guys and, and girls that uh, need to uh, have a visibility and alerts into resources and utilization of those resources through Azure Monitor, Azure Monitor alerting, uh, there is uh, something in there for the security groups that with Microsoft Defender and Microsoft Sentinel, 
Uh, there is management for Azure policy, update management, inventory management. Like there, they, there, there are a series of tools to basically cover everyone. And it's just a matter of turning it on. Once the, uh, a re the relationship with Azure is created with the ARC enable, the ARC agent, and that's what I call like the agent is like the, the agent that rules them all because it will manage installing all of the other agents uh, as you require them. Once that relationship is done, then you can take advantage of all these tools. And that list is just growing. Indeed. Yes. I mean, there seems to be new services coming out of constantly, right? And yeah, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we don't end up having no difference in terms of what's available in terms of management tools for whether or not your machine is uh, on-prem or whether or not it's in the Azure cloud. Yeah, good. Great. Listen, thank you. We're going to do some recapping of some of these key points towards the end of the show, Pierre. Um, okay. But now we're going to move on to what I think is, you know, this is my first time of doing this. Let's see what happens. Uh, this is the uh, part of this show is called the server acronym review. Um, okay. And I think like everyone involved in the tech world, I kind of, we all love a long, confusing acronym. And certainly my time in Microsoft, I thought I'd heard lots of acronyms before my friend, but my goodness me, there is, there is, it's just a plethora of acronyms out there. So, but look, luckily for us, the producers have found a few server acronyms to show us. Uh, we're going to put ourselves on the spot. I haven't seen these up to, up to now. Uh, clearly you haven't. Um, so let's see if we can guess what they are. Um, we'd love you guys out there to pop your thoughts in the comment section below. Tell us what you think about these acronyms. Uh, tell us what you think of us, whatever it may be. Um, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's move ahead. Now, um, AAS, or do I dare say it, ARS. Well, I was going to say my dyslexia kind of played tricks on me there for a second. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was something inappropriate, but anyway. Um, Air as a service? Perhaps. I'm thinking, mm, I was thinking, uh, no. Was I thinking Azure as a service? No, it can't be, can it? Azure is a service. No. Um, uh, automated something system? Automated audit system? I don't know. We're going to get some clue. Azure analysis. Azure analysis services. We okay. Kind of well, I should have known that one. You should have. I'm still learning. Clearly, <laughs> I'm month four, so you know I've got an excuse here, right? Um, shall we move on to the next one? Sure. Ooh, DB. Oh, database management system. Hey, I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, this one has been around for decades, so the acronym is not new. Uh, the acronym was not. Do we have any more out there? We've just got the two. I think that could be it. So look, I've been taking a couple of notes here, Pierre. So let me try and recap if I can. Um, yeah. In terms of you know the, the, the overall Azure Arc scenario, Arc enables that on-premise sort of interconnect. It yeah. comes at no cost. Um, if you start there for consuming services around Azure, there clearly is a cost, but then if you start offsetting that against other options, it's still a significant saving. Massively improves simplicity, operational simplicity, uh, gives you obviously a, a, you know, a single pane of glass across both your on-prem <laughs> and your public cloud Azure uh, infrastructure, shall we call it? Any cloud. Any cloud, of course. oh yes, of course, because we can move it into different clouds as well, right? Um, exactly. Um, and, you know, things like the AA models, the data, as I say, simplifying the operation. Um, anything else you want to add to that in terms of recapping? Well, th this is the, the main tool in terms of manage managing Windows and Linux servers in a hybrid model. Uh, there are other tools uh, such as, like, for example, the Windows Admin Center, uh, which is kind of like managing servers on-prem, but also is now a dedicated uh, plane, uh, a blade uh, on Azure. So it's embedded into Azure to manage servers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
so and those tools have kind of like overlapping capabilities and sometimes complementary capabilities. Um, so in on-prem through the Windows Admin Center, you could go to the hybrid center and basically enable uh, or turn on an Arc identity through it. So there's metal, that's just another way of onboarding a server into Arc. Um, but Windows Admin Center is a, also a great set of tools if you don't have a, a cloud footprint. So okay. it all depends on, it all depends on where you are in your journey. Some customers are going to be uh, on-prem only. Some customers are going to be cloud only, and the majority of customers are going to have a foot in both worlds. So Indeed. tools are there regardless uh, what your situation or where you are in that journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Pierre, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you for the first time, listening to your expert knowledge of one of our world's leading experts. I know you said you weren't, but from what I heard today, I would completely disagree. Um, and for you guys out there, please keep an eye out uh, right here on IT Ops Talk, LinkedIn or YouTube for the next episode, which I will again be hosting for the rest of this series. Uh, I'm not quite sure who's going to be joining us next time, but hopefully they're going to be, well, equally, if not Probably not near as good as what Pierre has, but I'm going to say that to the next guy as well, or lady for that matter. So look, remember to drop your thoughts below and thank you very much for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again, Pierre. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers.